So I smiled, and I said, I'm fine, even though I wasn't. I was dying inside. I felt like there was no one I could talk to and no one who would understand. You see, I was serving God as a missionary. Weren't missionaries supposed to have it together? How could I admit my terror? My husband had just been admitted to a psychiatric hospital. You can't just share that in prayer meeting. What would people think? You see, we had been preparing for a resort ministry conference, and people from all over the nation were coming in. And Michael was so nervous that he had not been sleeping for several nights. So he told me that he was going to go home and try and get, get a nap in before the conference began. So I continued to work and finish last-minute details. And then as I began to wrap things up, I decided I would just go to the gym. You see, for me, that's my stress release. That's how I let go of my stress. And so I thought, well, I'll go work out, and then I'll be prepared for tomorrow. And as I drove toward the gym, I heard that still, small voice, you know, the Holy Spirit saying to me, go home, go home. And I thought, what? I need, I need to reduce, leave some stress. I, I don't want to go home. And I heard it again. Go home. Go home. So I turned my car around, and I went home, and I found Michael asleep. And when I went to wake him, I couldn't. And beside the bed, there was an empty bottle of sleeping pills. So immediately, I called a friend, and I called 911, and Michael was rushed to the hospital. And praise the Lord, they were able to pump his stomach and save him. And Michael said, you know, I really wasn't trying to take my life. I just had not slept in so long that I took one pill and I still couldn't sleep. And I took another and another and I was determined to get rest. But you see, now our secret was out. He wasn't going to be at this conference. People would know. How could I protect him and stop rumors from flying? I mean, we're missionaries. I know. I'll just say, I'm fine, yeah. We're fine, but we weren't. We were broken. For you see, several years prior to this event, Michael had been struggling with what we now know as bipolar disorder. He would go into severe depressions where he wouldn't get out of bed. Um, when he did get out of bed, he would cry and cry and cry. Uh, he would avoid phone calls. He wouldn't go to work. And he was very, very down. And then he would come out of that, and he would be okay for a little while. And then he would go to the other extreme. And he would go days and days with very little sleep. Sometimes he would wake me up at 3 in the morning and say, Why are you sleeping? You're being lazy. Time's passing. Get up. Get out of bed. He would go several days without showering and would brag on it. He would talk really fast and be really busy with lots of high energy and get nothing done. And this cycle continued for years the depression, the mania, over and over again. But now our secret was out. People knew. Some well-meaning friends who loved Jesus told Michael, you must have unconfessed sin in your life. If you dealt with your sin, you would not struggle with depression. This is very similar to what Job's friends told him. You know, God's punishing you for something. So Michael would stay up night after night after night, praying, confessing every sin he could think of that he had ever committed in his entire life, and he would wake up the next morning, and the depression was still there. So this man who was already broken was beaten down even more as he felt like a failure, that even confession was not good enough to rescue him from depression. So when he shared this with those same friends, they told him, well, surely this is a lack of faith. You know, God is the great healer, and if you trust God, he will heal you, and he will make you well. So Michael thought that. He just started praying, Lord, increase my faith, increase my faith. And every time he would share that with me, the Lord would remind me of Paul. For you see, Scripture tells us that Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and he pleaded with the Lord three times, Lord, take this away. And what was God's answer? No. No. My grace is sufficient. Now, was God able to heal Michael and able to heal Paul? Absolutely. God is the great healer. But there are times when his answer is no. My grace is sufficient. You know, it's one thing to have faith for healing, and it's another to have faith to be sick. 
I felt so alone and so terrified. I didn't know what was happening. I felt like the tears would never stop. I wondered if my life was just destined to be one of heartache and pain. And at times I wondered if God was even listening because things weren't getting better. And during those times, the Psalms became like a balm to my spirit. As I read the Psalms, I felt like they got it. David and the other psalmists would cry out to the Lord in anguish and in heartache and pain. And I could relate to that. And the Lord led me to Psalm 42. And I want to share with you today some things that God taught me through this psalm. I don't pretend to be a preacher. These are just some things God spoke to me about ways to deal with pain and heartache. So I want to read to you from Psalm 42, verses 1 through 8. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How would I go with the throng and lead them into the procession to the house of God? With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope. In God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All the breakers and all your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. So there were five things the Lord really taught me about dealing with suffering. And the first is to give yourself permission to cry. In verse 2, it says, the psalmist said, my tears were my food day and night. And I can tell you, there were days I didn't think the tears would ever stop. I honestly thought that I would, I even journaled, will there ever be a day when I don't cry? Because I just cried all the time. And then I would get angry at myself. Get it together. Why are you crying all the time? And then someone shared with me Psalm 56, 8, which says, You have taken account of my wonderings and put my tears in a bottle. And that was revolutionary for me to think that God saves our tears. They're precious to him. Here I was ashamed of my tears. And I, and I wonder if one of the reasons they're precious to him is because it's a time when we're real before him. He knows our heart and our pain. And when we're crying, we're releasing that emotion to him. It's a way of releasing our pain. So in addition to giving yourself permission to cry, the second way to deal with suffering is to examine yourself and notice what your self-talk is. In verses 5 through 11, the psalmist says, Why are you so downcast, O my, oh my soul? Why so disturbed? Put your hope in God. In other words, what's wrong with you? Put your hope in God. I realized the talk that I had was, Why? Why am I going through this? Will I ever feel joy again? What's wrong with me? And I had to change that. And I had to cry out to the Lord. Not focus on my circumstances, but tell myself that God is still God. Which leads to number three. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. In verse six, it says, therefore I will remember you. So when has God helped you in the past? For us, this was not Michael's first time in a psychiatric hospital. He had been there before when he was manic, and we feared for his safety. God had seen us through then, and I knew God would see us again. He spent this, this particular episode, he spent months in the hospital, which was difficult because when everybody says, where's your husband? You know, I would just say, oh, he's out of town which wasn't a lie because the hospital was in another town. But again, there was that shame of, I couldn't really be honest. We're fine. We're fine. After months in the hospital and then several more months of outpatient therapy, Michael was finally released. You see, one of the beauty, beautiful things about bipolar disorder is it responds very well to treatment and to medication. And so once Michael got on the right balance of medication and, and he began to accept his illness, 
he got in a good place and he came home and we began to hope again. And number four in dealing with suffering is remember God's nature. In verse eight it says, by day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me. And I learned through this that God is always with us in the good, the bad. He is with us, he sees our pain, and he cares. So we finally had hope for the future. Life was turning around. We were starting back in ministry, and I took a group of college students to Passion in Atlanta. And while I was there, Francis Chan led a workshop called When Life Hurts. And I remember thinking as I went into that workshop, whew, I am glad that is behind me. The last several years have been nothing but pain and heartache and suffering, and I'm just glad that's behind me. But maybe I can go in here and hear something that might help somebody else. You ever been there? You know, oh, this will help them, and then God speaks to you. Well, one of the very first things that uh, Francis Chan said is, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? So I just want to ask you this morning, by show of hands, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? Okay, hands down. And the next question he asked rocked my world. He said, what if the Lord said, in order to make you look more like Jesus, I have to bring suffering into your life? How many of you want to be more like Jesus? And I honestly don't remember anything else about that message because that question kept going over and over in my mind. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Yes, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. Well, what if it's going to take suffering? Lord, my life has been nothing but suffering. Yeah, I want to be like you, but no buts. Do you want to be more like Jesus? And I began to wrestle with the Lord and eventually was on my knees and on my face before him crying out, Lord, I want to be like you, but I don't want to hurt. I have been through so much hurt and so much pain. I don't want to hurt anymore. And I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, Natalie, do you trust me? Yes, Lord, but. No, there's no but in trust. Do you trust me? And after what seemed like an eternity, I finally surrendered to the Lord and said, okay, Lord, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to suffer. But I want to be more like Jesus. And if that takes suffering, help me trust you. And I got up from my knees, and I went back to my room, and I called Michael, who was back home, and said, I, I want to tell you about this experience I just had with the Lord. And I could hear it in Michael's voice. The depression was back. And I said, oh, Michael, what's going on? Are you taking your medication? And he said, no. I just knew. I was doing so well. I knew that my faith was finally strong enough that God had healed me. And so I came off. And I wanted to surprise you. You see, what Michael didn't realize is God was using his medication to bring healing in his life. He had not healed him of the illness itself, but he was dealing with the symptoms. So the depression had returned. And the sad thing about antidepressants is it's not like Tylenol where you just take it and immediately feel the results. It takes weeks to get into your system to start feeling better. And so Michael went back to the doctor and started back on medication and we were hopeful. That Sunday, our college students were sharing in the church what we had experienced a passion. And I stood before my church family that Sunday night, and I shared with them the story I just shared with you. And the last thing I said to them was, you know, I don't really know what this week is going to hold, but I know three things. I know God is a good God. I know he is still on the throne and I know we can trust him. That was on Sunday, and on Friday, Michael took his life. I was faced with a choice. Was I going to trust God? I can't say it was easy. I was challenged by my own words. God, do I really believe you're good? I mean, we just sang about it. You are good, you are good, you never fail me. Do we really believe that? Did I really believe it? If God was in control, then why was Michael dead? He could have stopped it. God, why? The psalmist in verse 9, or excuse me, in verse, um, I lost my place. This in, yeah, in verse 9 says, I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? And I went through all of that, the questioning, which leads to number five. 
in your heartache and your suffering and your pain, call out to God and be willing to ask for help. Be real. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to that have told me, oh, you can't question God. And I want to say, have you read the Psalms? David questioned God all the time, and yet he was a man after God's own heart. God knows our heart. He knows our questions. All those questions about, Lord, why didn't you stop it? He, he can handle those. And I still don't know the answer to all my questions. I do know God didn't cause what happened. He allowed it. And why? I may never know this side of heaven. But I know he's a good God. He's still on the throne. And we can trust him. If you're struggling... And in in the statistics say, one in four of you in here are, I want you to know that there is hope. Don't give up. You know, this week is Suicide Prevention Week. This is a week that if you're struggling and you're hurting, to ask for help. I want you to know you matter. The God of the universe sent his son to die for you, to die for us. He sees you and he cares. In the worst pit of my grief, The Lord was with me. He saw my pain. Even when I didn't feel his presence, he was with me. He never left me. You know, one of the symbols of suicide prevention is the semicolon. And in writing, you use a period to say this is the end. But a semicolon means there's more to come. And for some of you that are really struggling, I want to encourage you that maybe this is your pause to say, okay, God wants to intersect your story and write something new. Because even losing Michael, that was not the end of my story. And honestly, it's not the end of his story because God continues to use it even after his death. I also want you to know that we are so blessed to be in a university that sees the value in counseling. And if you are hurting or struggling and you need to talk to someone... True, it will connect you with local counselors for a limited number of sessions to get help. And if you need that, talk to me, um, talk to student services, we can connect you. There is help available. And some of you in here have lost someone to suicide. You've experienced that anguish and the grief and maybe the questions and the guilt. Oh, the guilt was so hard. How could I have not known? What could I have done? I would have, I could have, I should have. It can be unbearable. But I want you to know that God is bigger than all of that. He is able to heal all of that pain. And he often uses others to come alongside us and help us in that. Seven years of grieving I finally began to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, Mom, I have hurt for so long. Would you make this the year of Jubilee in my life? Would you make this a time where I can just see your glory and see your presence? I don't even know what that looks like, Lord, but will you restore the years the locusts have, ate, have eaten and just make this a year of Jubilee? This was seven years after Michael died. And during that year, I reconnected with an old friend And the more we got to know each other, I learned that his mother also struggled with bipolar disorder. As we began to share the the heartaches of living with someone with mental illness, we really bonded over the emotional pain. We connected over how they would get well for a season and then stop their medication and it would all start the roller coaster again. And God had more in store for that friendship Because I am so thankful today to say that this friend, Jeff Ford, is now my husband. And unfortunately, in 2017, we lost his mom to suicide. Once again, I felt tremendous guilt. See, this time I was a professional. I'm an advocate for suicide prevention. And yet, I couldn't save my mother-in-law. The hurt, the pain, the shame... Michael, Sherry, Leah, Emmett, Glenn, Jesse. These are all people that I knew personally, intimately, who all loved Jesus. But they took their eyes off of Jesus and put them on their circumstances and lost hope. And instead of reaching out and accepting help, they gave in to despair. And they all died by suicide. I beg you... 
If this is you, if you are hurting, ask for help. You don't have to live this way. There is hope. As long as God is on the throne and he will always be, then there is hope. So give yourself permission to cry. Pay attention to the talk that's going on in your head. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. Remember his nature. He is good. He is good. Even when you don't feel like the things in your life are good, he is good. And call out to him and be willing to ask for help. I recently learned about these little creatures, otters. Some of you biologists in here may know this already. But otters live in the, they tend to hunt in the ocean. And when they get sleepy and they need a nap, they find a friend and they hold hands. And this keeps them from drifting away from the group. Sometimes you'll see hundreds of otters all linking hands, holding on, napping peacefully. And scientists call this a raft. In a way, they're protecting each other when they're most vulnerable, when they're sleeping. There's safety in that connection. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 10, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. That reminds me of this raft building. And so I just want to ask you, as I close out today, is there somebody's hand you need to grab out to? Do you need to ask somebody to hold your hand and help you because you're going through a tough time? Or maybe someone you know is struggling and you need to stand alongside them and say, you know what, I can't make this better, but I'm going to walk through this with you. Because, you know, there were, not, there were no words anyone could say after losing Michael and losing Sherry. But what meant the most were the people who just stayed beside us, who would walk beside us, who would allow me to just cry without judgment and shame and just be there. So maybe you need to be that for someone else. So I just want to remind you that even when everything else in the world seems to be falling apart in 2020, seems like there is nothing stable about it, to cling to what you know is true. Because honestly, these three statements are what got me through the darkest days, and that is that God is a good God. He is still on the throne, and we can trust him. Will you pray with me? Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you that you are faithful even when we don't see it or we don't know it and we seem like there, it seems like there's no hope, Lord. We know there is because you are our hope. And Lord, I pray for those in here today who are struggling. I just pray that you would meet them where they are and help them to trust you, Lord, when they feel there's no way, I just pray you would reach out and hold them close and assure them of your love and your faithfulness. And for those who need to reach out for help, that there would be no shame, that there would be courage, and that they would be willing to say, no, I'm not fine. I'm broken. And that they would receive help. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.